Thank you, Don Wook, and thank you all for being here. It sounds like I can tell already there's a lot of great stuff happening at UBC, so thank you for taking some time out to come and see this. My name is Nick Merrill. I'm visiting from University of California, Berkeley, and I'm here to talk about uh, this talk, Mo Models of Minds, Belief, Sensing, and Security, a title which I hope will make a lot more sense once I start telling you about it. I did my PhD at the uh, at, uh, Berkeley School of Information in a group called Biosense. Uh, we study biosensing technologies, technologies that sense the body and space. And now I'm a postdoc at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And I'm sure that you can all imagine some relationships between biosensing and cybersecurity. And hopefully you'll learn about a few new relationships at the end of this talk as well. OK. So I started my PhD doing this project called Pass Lots. And just straw poll, I'm always curious. Who here has already heard about this Pass Lots project? A couple people have heard about it, maybe. Um, so the idea behind this project is that you think your password. Okay. You, instead of typing a password, you think a secret thought, and that secret thought you know, logs you into things. It authenticates you. Um, and we've gotten some great press about this. This nice gift was done uh, by a publication called Neo.life. Uh, but the idea here is you have a brain scanner, and you come up with a secret thought. Let's say, you know, I imagine myself swimming. So I think, sit there, think, you know, imagine myself swimming and this serves to log me in. So a couple advantages to this approach. One advantage is that it's very hard to shoulder surf. You see someone typing a password, and then you know, you know the password, right? Another one is that even if I know your secret pass thought is you thinking about swimming, me thinking about swimming is not going to be the same as you thinking about swimming. So the, the way that we express our thoughts neurally are quite different, even when we're thinking about the same thing, right? Um, and there are actually a number of advantages I can go through about uh, pass thoughts and a lot of interesting things. It's hard to spoof. Uh, all these different factors in a single step. Lots of interesting stuff to discuss. Um, and you might be also wondering to yourself, what does this brain scanning device look like exactly that you use? Well, we've gone through several iterations, and most recently, we've gotten it down to this earbud. You put it inside your ear. Really, you can imagine this something that could someday be in something like a, um, uh, an AirPod or whatever you might listen to music in. And it senses brainwave signals through the ear canal. Now, I will tell you, so much more about how the scanner works as we go through the talk. But first, as many of you know, when you're working on a technical project like this, you have a lot of time to think about other things. And one of the things I was thinking about while going through a lot of this past thoughts work is, you know, what are the limits here? What can a device like this really know about thoughts? We have a model that works for our very limited scope for authentication, but really how far can we go? And this was triggered, actually, by uh, this fact I learned about ants, which actually changed my life. So this ant has been taken over by a fungus, actually a complex of different fungi. And this fungus, these fungi have in infected the ant's body and wrapped themselves around the ant's nervous system, around its muscles. You can see right here in the lower left, they're actually this fungus is wrapping around the ant's mandible muscle. And this fungus will actually force the ant to move its body through the environment, go find a twig, and get to the underside of the twig, and then bite onto the twig. And the ant will remain there and become a medium for fungal reproduction. Okay, so this is a very extreme example. 
Now, putting aside the degree of control that this fungus needs to do in order to operate this, the actual control of the body, imagine for a second the degree of sensing that the fungus needs to do. This fungus is aware of the ant's environment through its relationship with the body, such that it's able to navigate the environment in a pretty fine-grained way. It's able to find its way to the twig. It's able to affix itself to the twig. This is really a remarkable um, degree of sensing. And one of the most remarkable things about it, to me, is that it doesn't require the brain at all. This fungus has no relationship with the ant's brain. It's in the ant's body, alone. So looking at this image of the fungus wrapped around the ant's mandible muscle, we can look uneasily toward the emerging world of wearable sensors, <laughs> sensors that, that detect the body in space. OK, so let's think through these examples. These wearables on this person's arm, this person has an experience of movement in space. And these devices have a model of movement in space. We're not sure that the model is really similar to the experience, but they are about the same thing. The ant you know, has this experience of moving through space, and the fungus has this model of the ant's experience that allows it to navigate the world in this really fine-grained way. With past thoughts, we have this experience of thinking about swimming doing the past thought. And we have this model that allows the past thought authenticator to do its job. So my question is, what does this person think, what does this person believe about the models that these devices generate? What, is, what does this person believe about the capabilities of those models? And what do the people designing these devices believe about the capabilities of these models? OK, so the roadmap for the talk here, and this will become much more evident as I go through it, is this kind of co-construction between our beliefs about the mind and body and these technologies that aim to sense the mind and body. And this is mediated through our use of technologies and the way we build technology. OK, I'm going to go through a lot more as we go through the talk. But keep this in your mind. And also note, you may think that this cycle is error correcting, where we get closer and closer to some reality. And we'll see if that's true as we go through the talk. OK. Um, so there are going to be three kind of parts to this talk, two main studies. First, I'm going to go through a lab-based experiment about heart rate. Second, I'm going to go through a technology probe that involves this past thought authenticator I told you more about. And we're going to go into a little more detail about EEG and brain scanning. And finally, I'm going to go through some future work for security and hopefully some provocative questions that will take us through the question and answer section. And there, is, there are some kind of a wide variety of methods here, so buckle your seatbelts. All right. So first, lab-based experiment with heart rate. So think back, if you can. The year was 2016 year hopefully we all remember, maybe despite ourselves. And Apple has just released this Apple Watch. Does everyone remember the heart rate feature, Apple Watch? And you could share your heart rate with your friend? <laughs> OK. So this was puzzling to me. And I was kind of crawling the internet for apps that involved the heart rate with the Apple Watch. And I found this one app. This is a real app I found at the time called Cardiogram. And their sales pitch was, what's your heart telling you? you know, your heart beats all throughout the day, it reacts to everything that happens in your life. And you can see this useful chart they provided for you with your Skype interview. So kind of the implicit assumption here is that your heart is reacting to your emotions. Your heart is reflective of your emotions. And if you can see your heart, you can know something about your emotions you didn't know before. OK. So this is asking you, what's your heart telling you? And kind of I look to the literature. What is your heart telling you? So there were actually all of these studies in the 70s and 80s that looked at heart rate, people listening to their own heart rate and then making some judgments about how they were feeling. People manipulated the heart rate. The basic takeaway from these studies is that if you see, if you're told that your heart rate is elevated, you feel that you are more stressed. And if you are told your heart rate is normal, you're more likely to feel that you're calm and not anxious. So looking back to the social application, sharing your heart rate, our question was, me and my collaborator, Coy Cheshire, what's your heart rate telling someone else? And to answer this question, we focused on trust. Trust is a fundamental building block of human relationships. And in particular, we focused on dyadic pairs, which is the world's fanciest way of saying pairs of two. Okay. Um, and we, we looked at trust through this uh, experiment called the prisoner's dilemma experiment, iterated prisoner's dilemma. Some of you may be familiar with it. And I'll explain a lot more about that in a second. But we had two major hypotheses here. First, if you see your partner had an elevated heart rate, you're going to think that your partner was, had a more negative mood. Again, this is just straightforwardly from 
the, uh, the studies on one's own heart rate that I just mentioned. And then second, if you see your partner has an elevated heart rate, you'll trust them less and you'll cooperate less. And I'll go into very specific details about what that means. Uh, but the, the concept here is that if they're, if they're in a negative mood, maybe that, you know, they're not going to trust you, they're not going to cooperate in the same way. Okay. So we did a lab study, 56 students recruited from Berkeley, 41 men, women, 14, 14 men, and one who identified with neither gender with a mean age of 21. And we played, again, an iterated prisoner's dilemma game. So the idea is you put a human player in there, and they're paired with another player. Now, we told them they were paired with another player. In reality, they were paired with a bot. Okay, but they thought it was another player. And the key here, there are two things you can do at any time. You can cooperate or you can defect. You can choose to uh, uh, give to your partner or you can choose to kind of, you know, cheat your partner out of points. Uh, and there's a points-based game. You can look at the paper for more details here. But the key thing to know is that we had this robot program to always cooperate this robot never defected on their partner. They always entrusted their partner and they were reciprocal. They used the partner's behavior to kind of model how much they should give back. But we wanted to make a, a perfectly cooperative partner to kind of isolate our variable of interest here. So the real kind of outcome here is that at any step, the human could cooperate or the human could defect on their partner. Okay. So there's a moment in this game where you make a decision, your partner makes a decision, and there's a moment where you find out what your partner did. So during this critical moment, or rather right before this critical moment, we had the partner put their finger on a heart rate scanner. At least that's what we told them it was. They put their finger on this device. They said, OK, OK. And now they see what their partner decided to do to them. Their finger's still on the heart rate scanner. Take their finger off. And then they see either your partner's heart rate was normal or your partner's heart rate was elevated. And they saw the same thing every time. We'd move the thing around a little bit. Basically, their partner's heart rate was always normal or their partner's heart rate was always elevated. And again, remember, the cooperation was constant. The, the bot behaved the same way for everybody. They, the only manipulation was that, um, that heart rate visualization that, that the human player saw. OK, so what happened? After the study, we had uh, participants rank their partner on various emotional attributes. And if you had a partner with an elevated heart rate, you thought that they were more anxious and less calm. Okay, this shouldn't be shocking, right? This is really in line with kind of the studies from analyzing your own heart rate. Now, interestingly, and I'll note this only briefly, we did not see an, uh, an effect for easily upset and emotional. One reason here might be that anxiety and calm, that's how you're feeling in the moment, whereas easily upset and emotional, that's more of a personality trait or <coughs> longitudinal characteristic. So maybe people look at heart rate as more something you know, reflective of kind of instantaneous kind of uh, 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 things rather than longitudinal ones, which is interesting. Okay, but here's the really interesting part. When your partner had an elevated heart rate, you cooperated with them less frequently. You were more likely to defect on your partner when they had an elevated heart rate, even though the partner was always cooperating. Okay, so why, why? So fortunately, we add some qualitative data uh, we collected after the study. We asked people, what did your partner's heart rate tell you about them? In the elevated heart rate condition, we saw something like, oh, well, it said how excited he or she was, whether he or she cheated. Now, remember, the partner never cheated, but elevated heart rate told me whether they cheated. Okay. Uh, or it was elevated all the time, so I think she or she was anxious, so I guess he or she did not completely trust me. Okay, well, even though they're always cooperating, clearly they don't entirely trust me, so I'm not going to entirely trust them, right? Now, some people didn't fit the mold. You know, you get people, for example, this person said, well, my partner's heart rate was elevated the whole time, but most students are stressed, so I guess that's why. Okay. But in the whole, you did see this effect. Now, looking to the normal heart rate condition, people said, oh, well, heart rate sig signaled that my partner was always calm. Okay. If I had contradicted them, their heart rate probably would have changed in response. So clearly, this partner, just, this, uh, this participant clearly just never contradicted their partner and never saw a change. Okay. Now, uh, we can discuss a few things here already, but first I want to ask a very important question. How specific are these findings to heart rate? Would we have if seen the same effect with any elevated biosignal, right? So to answer this question quickly, we decided to do the exact same experiment, but replaced every mention of the word heart rate with this word SRI, skin reflectivity index. You might be wondering, what's skin reflectivity index? We just made it up. The point here is that they had never heard of it. It was an unfamiliar biosignal. 
And we just wanted to know if it's elevated, if it's normal, will we see the same effect that we saw? And we did make one more change. We ran a study quickly with the finger as it was, but people said, oh, I think that was actually just heart rate. So we decided we'd use the heart rate scanner in a different way, just put your palm over it. And then they were convinced this was some new thing called skin reflectivity index. OK. Ran the exact same experiment. What did we find? The effect disappeared. OK, why? Why? We looked at the qualitative data again. Elevated SRI condition, people said, well, since their SRI was always high and they always gave the money back to me, I assume the two are correlated and an elevated SRI means that they're going to give the money back. I guess it means they're trustworthy. <laughs> okay? How about the normal SRI condition? Well, it shows you how anxious or nervous they are if their SRI is high. This person never saw a high SRI, right? Or a person is less likely to trust other people if he or she has a high SRI. Again, this person never saw a high SRI. They saw a cooperative partner, a partner who always gave the points back to them, and they saw a normal SRI. And this, these people, they saw their partner always gave the money back to them, and they saw a high SRI. OK, so what do we learn here? Going back to this chart. The heart rate study, we take these beliefs about the mind and the body, these beliefs about heart rate, and they really affect the way we use technologies, such that they affect behavior mediated through the technologies, right? However, we see this technology telling us something new, and it affects our beliefs about the body and mind. The technology is able to teach us something new in the absence of prior information. So taken together, we see kind of two sides of this, uh, of this cycle uh, through the use of technologies. However, one thing this does not answer. Oh, one more thing, actually, that I think is really interesting here. We were able to teach someone this new thing. They saw this correlation between um, SRI and, and you know, they said, oh, well, it means they were cooperative. Even though the bot behaved the same way in both, their beliefs about heart rate were so strong that the, even the repeated interaction was not able to overcome this prior belief. But it was in the, in the unknown signal condition. OK, it's kind of interesting. We'll return to it later. But uh, one thing we did not learn from this study, what about the building side? What about people who build technologies? OK, so this takes us to the next study, technology probe with past thoughts. Now, before we get too deep into it, first of all, who has heard about EEG before? A lot of people. Who's pretty confident they know how EEG works? OK, fewer. Great. Perfect. OK, sorry. Uh, so you have this brain. Yes, all of us have one. Many of us use it. The problem with it is that it's in the skull. We can't get at it directly. But fortunately, the brain emits electromagnetic radiation as it does its job. Neurons firing produce some kind of electromagnetic radiation. In aggregate, populations of neurons produce patterns of neuronal firing that can be picked up on outside the scalp. So we pick up on it like this, right? No, OK. This is a lot of electrodes. But these days, there are very readily available commercial devices like this or like this. This device is produced by a Canadian company called Interaxon. And uh, you can sense EEG quite discreetly. OK, fine. I've told you what it is, but how does it work and what can you actually know about it, right? So to explain this, I, I like to use this analogy of a baseball stadium, or maybe in Canada, a hockey stadium, right? You have this baseball stadium, and a bunch of people are in there screaming. So you want to know what's going on in the baseball stadium. You put four microphones outside of it, kind of far away. These microphones are not going to be able to pick up on conversations inside the stadium, right? But they are going to tell you kind of how loud people are screaming and maybe roughly what section they're screaming in. This is kind of the type of resolution you can expect from EEG. It's very broad, aggregate. It is not specific enough to know particular thoughts. However, a lot of people in Silicon Valley have been talking about it a lot lately. And around the time we were putting this project together, Facebook got someone went on stage and said, we are going to have people type with their brains using EEG. So EEG researchers thought that this was a laughable claim. But in any case, it was taken really seriously by people in Silicon Valley. And you see also around that same time these headlines in Wired, brain machine interface is not sci-fi anymore. And at around the same time, all of these companies are flooding the market with different types of devices to sense EEG. So clearly, something's going on here. There's something in the water. Brain computer interfaces out there, and people have these beliefs about it. So the question is, how do Silicon Valley software engineers conceive of brain computer interfaces and their capabilities? And a very closely related question, a question that's more closely related than I would have thought, how do they conceive of the mind and brain in relation to these kinds of capabilities? OK. 
So to answer this question, we took this Muse headset that I mentioned earlier, and we built kind of a boiled down version of the Passlot system. And we went into software engineers in Silicon Valley's place of work, and we gave them the system and let them use it in real time. And we used this kind of to lull them into philosophical conversations about the brain and mind. Okay. So first of all, which engineers? Uh, we decided to pick engineers that had no prior experience developing BCIs. People who have developed BCIs, like me, are very jaded about it. They know the limitations, but we were anticipating the expansion of BCI's practice, and we're looking to the next frontier of practitioners. So, we picked these folks who we thought would be more comfortable extrapolating, and in particular, we picked engineers who had a stated interest in BCI. There's this long history, and I can you know, give you a citation, I guess it fell off the slide here, but hacking and tinkering, uh, going back to kind of garage clubs in Silicon Valley, have this long history of leading to commercial development. So we were interested in people who would get their hands dirty, start tinkering in the future, and we were interested in their beliefs about a brain-computer interface to see how it might uh, shape technical practice in the future. Our goals here, as I said, were to get people talking about BCIs, their beliefs about the mind. So we decided to use a technology probe here. I don't have a tremendous amount of time to go into this really fascinating uh, method from design research, but the idea here is that we gave people a working brain-computer interface and our particular goal was to activate what Goodwin calls professional vision, which I'll talk about a bit more in a second. Um, in broad strokes, we got eight software engineers, three of them were women, 23 to 26, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we gave them this probe over a one hour session. Okay, so I mentioned the probe, how did it actually work? Well, there are a lot more details in the paper, but basically we got EEG data from them, we were talking with them, and while they were talking, we were collecting EEG data from them, you know, about 10, 15 minutes of data, and we fed this into a, a binary classifier we would train. And we had this corpus we had pre-recorded of people who were not the subject. So we had these positive and negative examples. And the goal of this was just to say, you are wearing the device or you are not wearing the device. So we got rid of the secret thought aspect here. So after we trained the device, we would show them some real-time feedback. They would have the device on their head. Uh, or sometimes they would take it off their head because a lot of people didn't believe this device actually worked. But in any case, they were wearing it. And this binary classifier would spit out these accept or reject. You are wearing this, you're not wearing this. So the feedback they saw looked like this. They would see these uh, zeros and ones, zeros accept, ones reject, and would stream across the screen like this, a rate of about uh, one every half second, I think, 512 hertz. And so they would see these kinds of uh, ambiguous feedback like this. You know, this is like broadly an accept. This is broadly a reject. This one is totally ambiguous. We're not sure if it's an accept or reject. OK, some of you now are thinking, this is not even a UI. This is literally just a terminal. Okay, the design here was that engineers live in, you know, among other things, the terminal. This is their professional place of work. And we wanted to activate their professional vision we, in, you know, in this particular case, this means we wanted them to think critically about the device, to think about it as an engineer. So we wanted to emulate the experience of debugging in their terminal. And by the way, this did work. I mean, I don't have time to go into it now, but engineers really did want to take the hood off and see what was happening there and read the code and understand. So, uh, you know, this technical kind of, um, this technical critical process was our in to get, to get them to think about this device and what it can really do. As I said, we also lulled them into philosophical conversations. And the results here broadly are that uh, we saw engineers have really diverse beliefs about what the mind is. But they shared this general belief that machines will somehow read the mind. Okay. So what is the mind? There are really a lot of philosophical debates about this and something really interesting to go into. And a lot of these things map onto those debates. But this is about what engineers believe. And what we found here is kind of three major buckets of beliefs that engineers express. The first is that the brain is the mind. We have this brain, that's where all of these kind of, this is cognition is happening. And a lot of these people also believe the brain is a computer, you know, it takes input, it gives output, that's the mind. There's another kind of broad bucket here that the mind is potentially more expansive than the brain. Maybe we do cognition with our bodies, maybe we do cognition with our tools, the tools, you know, end up being extensions of the mind as well. And then a third broad bucket of belief here is that the mind and brain are basically social constructs with no logical bottom. We invent these categories and put things in them. Uh, and that's a social process. They might be correlated with physical phenomena, 
But that doesn't mean that there is this real thing in the world that is the mind that has delineated boundaries. It's a discursive process, right? And some of you are thinking, wow, engineers think of these things? Yeah, engineers are really critical. OK. Um, so despite these really diverse beliefs, we have this kind of shared belief across all of them that the mind will be read by machines. So here's one participant. We're driven by single-celled organisms in ways we don't really understand yet. But there's got to be some sort of physical storage of memories or experiences. We just haven't quite learned how to read it yet. So this participant doesn't believe that you know, the mind ends at the brain necessarily. Maybe single-celled organisms and other things that this participant pointed out are potentially components of the mind. However, the physical nature of the mind, the physical nature of all of these entities, means that we will someday read it in this participant's view. Even more extreme example, the mind may have no logical bottom, but practically this has no implication. We could still devise an authentication tool that does the job. Maybe in some way there could be this ESP thing where you could somehow read my thoughts. If we want to do something, we'll find a way. Okay, so the same logic, in, you know, in the paper, more details about um, this particular participant, the same logic that convinced this participant that the mind and brain are discursive categories also convinced this participant that the mind will be readable because we believe it's readable, because we will find ways to build technologies to find the mind such that it becomes readable. Okay, so we have these really different beliefs about what the mind is, but the shared belief somehow that we're going to have technologies that read it. So we see this kind of, again, these beliefs about the mind through building somehow feed into technologies. We have not learned yet, of course, or how these technologies, how building them actually affects our beliefs about the mind. And this is a really interesting area for future work, and that's going to bring me the final part here, future work for security. Okay. So what does this all mean for security? We have these mind-reading machines. I'm sure, like some of you, you think there is a potential problem here. Yes, there are a few potential problems here. Uh, one thing that I'm currently working on a paper I just submitted, first of all, there are major mismatches in what users believe and what designers believe. On one hand, you may have users thinking that there are these really creepy brain-computer interfaces, whereas designers think these things can't actually do anything. And on the other hand, you may have users saying, you know, GPS is in my cell phone, it's totally innocuous, I'm fine giving that data up. And on the other side of that, you have designers saying, I can detect depression from GPS data. <laughs> these mismatches are really potentially important. So the thing to it, that I'm trying to attune myself here, going through this future work, is uh, this long history of literature and surveillance studies. Uh, there's this great book called Dark Matters, which I definitely recommend by Simone Brown, about the racial history of surveillance. It may not shock you to learn that surveillance has a racial history. And indeed, you know, we as researchers should continue to kind of draw on this work as we try to reason through these sort of emerging frontier in surveillance of the mind. And similarly, there are you know, really important relational markers that create different kinds of vulnerabilities. Some work I just finished with collaborators, James Pierce, Sarah Fox, Richmond Wong, we were looking at security toolkits. Uh, these are kind of online resources that help you bolster your cybersecurity, right? And one of the core findings of this work is that depending on who you are, you face different kinds of security threats. You have the Homeland Security Department you know, in the US giving this toolkit that protects you from anarchists. <sighs> And you have anarchists giving out this toolkit that protects you from the Department of Homeland Security, right? Um, and these relational markers matter a lot for who, what you're vulnerable to and whose security you're talking about, right? So there's a really tight relationship with surveillance studies that I hope we look into uh, uh, further. And at the same time, it's important to keep in mind, a lot of these tools of surveillance can also be tools of resistance and activism. And again, there's a great work here, uh, Black Cyber Feminism uh, by Tracy McMillan. Uh, Cotton, which uh, I could not recommend more highly. The key takeaway here is that, yes, you know, these surveillance technologies have uh, you know, really tight entanglement with relational markers and what they're meant to do and who they're meant to protect or not protect. And at the same time, they can be subverted in ways that actually resist or disrupt those same means of, of surveillance. Um, so we should really continue to look toward this critical work in surveillance studies and kind of grappling with these topics. Uh, at the same time, kind of a parallel observation is that the engineers in that second study I shared with you have this amazing speculative capacity to see security threats. And it's not something that comes up in their day-to-day -day job, but it is a capacity that they have. So my question is, you know, could this speculative capacity actually certain surface threats 
as a security practice. Can you put engineers in such a, a kind of situation where they're able to look at speculative scenarios that help surface actual bugs and issues in the software that they're building? Um, so stay tuned for much more on that, or talk to me afterward about it. Um, it's what I'm working on currently. And then finally, a question that's near and dear to my heart. What does this all mean for the mind? Uh, a lot of people ask questions, and you'll hear these qu kinds of questions very often. Are minds machines? Are our minds machines? Uh, can machines think? Can machines be conscious? And so here's another question to add to the mix, a related question. How are minds and machines already entangled? How are they always already kind of co-constructed? How are our ideas of minds already really tightly informed by the machines that are available to us? And vice versa, how do, machines, how do minds change the way that we conceive of, think about machines? And so maybe it's really hard to disentangle this kind of mind category from this machine category in the end. Uh, so a related question, how do we remake minds through the things that sense them? When we build, this goes back to this kind of question here. When we build machines that seek to sense the mind, how does that active process shape our ideas of what the mind is? Not so obvious what the answer is. Um, definitely a tricky problem for, for a lot of future work. No one study is going to really help us understand this. And then finally, how are mind and security already entangled too? How much, to what degree does security already concern itself with notions of mind? Security protects what we think about, it protects what we know, how different, you know, how new is this really to think about the kind of mental security and mental privacy? So I think that there's a lot of maybe revisionist work to be done here when we're looking at uh, kind of security in general and also going forward toward new frontiers, what security can do. Okay, so with that, I'd like to first of all acknowledge all of my amazing collaborators that helped me with all of this work. And also, as promised, you know, I told you you might discover some new relationships between biosensing and computer security. I hope that you have. And so with that, I would like to turn over to questions. Thank you. Great question. Uh, we told them after we, so there's this kind of the points that they're gambling, gambling with. Uh, their performance in the game dictates to some degree how much money they get at the end of the game. So the protocol was they finish the study, they do the questionnaire, and when we're handing them their final performance check, we tell them, you know, by the way, the person you were playing with, we told you was another person in the room who was actually a bot, and that bot always cooperated. Yeah. And we got a diversity of responses there. No one was upset. Uh, some people said, oh, huh, that explains a lot. Um, and then some other people said, oh, that's interesting. If I had known that, I would have just entrusted them all the time. I thought, yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, thinking about it later. Because the bot was always entrusting you, but you didn't always reciprocate. So it's interesting to think why that may have happened. And really, it was, if it was just the heart rate that changed that behavior and nothing else, you know, how do technologies in general mediate trust in the way that we interact with them? You know, we're on these kind of social media platforms, we trust people in different kinds of ways, so what is the feedback here and what are the cues? And clearly this is some really, really high dimensional space that we think about, but uh, yeah. Great, really great question. There was a question from the back. Yeah. yeah. First of all, thank you for the talk. Um, thank you. Um, so I guess I, I can appreciate the, that, you know, it, it, the, the work that, that goes into reading mind and being able to detect what, what, what mind is actually doing in, in, in very fine details. But I guess where I'm confused a little bit or I can't make the connection is um, what is the future that you're envisioning? Is, is, is the future that we're envisioning for this project is to just be able to read mind or is it to be able to control mind? Um, and, you know, the premise of this it, is, is there a gap right now um, in, in the way we do things in our society right now that really needs us to read mind? 
um, and if we don't read mine, or if we're not able to read mine, um, what is the price that we're going to pay? Yeah, these are all great questions. These are all questions I hope people answer over kind of really long time scales. You asked, what is the future I'm envisioning? The future I'm envisioning is one in which people are safe online. That is not the world we live in. People are not safe when they use technology. And when we're looking toward kind of these reactive modes of fixing the problems that we face, doxing, harassment, all of these issues are, again, closely related to relational markers. They're racialized, they're gendered, uh, they're political. And when we see kind of a, an encroaching frontier, or at least rhetoric about an encroaching frontier, what does this mean for safety? Is this going to make us less safe? And does it need to make us less safe? So the future I'm envisioning is not necessarily one specific technical outcome. It's about how researchers can embed themselves in technical practice in such a way that we can get out in front of potential problems. Because to me, that's what didn't happen this time around. And uh, you know, I think that a lot of the good research can do, a lot of the social good research can do, is trying to look around corners in a way that, you know, for a variety of reasons, private industry isn't always incentivized to. Um, I hope that at least answers around your question. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I, I can really appreciate you know, having safety online, especially nowadays. But I guess my, I mean, I'm advocating for the evil side now, saying that, you know, is, are, do we need to come to a realization at this point that just like everything else in our life, there is an inherent level of risk in every activity that we engage in in, a daily, in our daily life. So if I pick up a knife to do kitchen work, there's an inherent level of uh, safety there, or, or, or insecurity there, uh, and risk. Just like operating a gun might be, just like put, uh, sitting in a car and, and going for a drive might be. Um, so do we need to come up with a, an understanding that, okay, we accept there's an inherent level of risk, when, when we're engaging in online activity? Or do we need to make online activity completely bulletproof? These are interesting questions. I would love to follow up more of them offline. I'll answer them maybe with another question, which is just, are these risks the same for everyone? Or do different people have different kinds of risks? And are the people aware of these different kinds of risks that they engage in when they engage? Are the risks obvious? And are the risks consistent? So I would love to talk about this a little bit more as well, because it's a really interesting topic. Yeah. Uh, yes? Um, are you thinking of looking at other biomarkers, like Yes. Yes. And in fact, I just submitted a paper where we kind of threw a bunch of stuff at the wall um, and tried to get some kind of rough ranking. So I would love to talk a little bit more about that, because it ends up being really interesting when you see this kind of comparative analysis. Yes. When you talk about the, the hand of the fungus, I, I think if I understood correctly, you said something about there being the fungus somehow had a bottle of the ant's brain because it didn't actually. But, so that sounds a little bit like the joke about the AI person who says the greatest invention in the world is the thermos because it keeps hot stuff hot and cold stuff cold. And it says, but how does it know? <laughs> so what is it about that? example with the ant and fungus that demands a belief that there's a model there. That's a really we have lots of systems, not computer systems, that are totally mechanical, where I don't think anyone would say that there was a model of anything. It simply is a process mechanism, whatever, that does things. Whoever designed it might have a model in mind. Right. But the artifact itself is just the artifact. And what is it about the fungus that suggests that it has anything other than it's just a response, stimulus response system that perhaps was designed by an intelligent designer, but the model would be there, not in the fungus. I think it's a really interesting question. I would be curious to think a little bit more about how this kind of boundary between model and process kind of gives us different analytical slant on what's happening and how it becomes relevant in our analysis. So maybe something interesting to talk about. It seems to me that, that I mean, this is probably a naive characterization, but to me, what typically characterizes something that is AI versus a program that simply does something 
is whether an explicit component of the program is typically a data structure or something which is intended in the program by the programmer, obviously, to be a model that is used. And, and, and so we see this in model view controller, et cetera, where there is this explicit representation as opposed to no explicit representation other than data sort of flowing through. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, in that, in that perspective, it sounds like a kind of unsupervised machine learning would be not a model. Right? It's interesting, interesting perspective. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. So, I, my um, stepbrother is actually in academia, and he does research from the psychology side of things, um, using like dynamical systems models to look at all kinds of biometrics and in interactions, and then have like a third party um, view and code that and decide some meaningful thing about how that interaction is going. Oh. Um, and so, I'd be curious to know, like, like he looks at that third party evaluation all the time and I feel like that's where a lot of people are is like trying to get this like representation of the situation. But it would be really interesting to know like what the two people think is going right. on. If you gave them feedback, would they interpret that differently than like this model that has all of this external information um, built into it, right? Like, because it, it occurred to me that when people are making these decisions about the other person's heart rate, like they may not know anything about what heart rate tells you to begin with, um, and then like, that, so we don't actually know the starting place of their model, like how many parameters are involved and how accurate they are, and then they only get like a tiny bit of data, really, right? Like they get like a few interactions with this bot to like update that representation. Um, and so like, is there a way to know people's starting place? Right. Um, and then like, like push that representation one way or the other with like very little data, or maybe people have lots of data to do that, I don't know. This is all really interesting. So here's what I can add. So this. A uh, study I mentioned where we looked at a variety of different sensors. Uh, we kind of tried to look a little more deeply into it. And I, I referenced this pretty quickly. Um, oh, well, anyway. Point is, yes, people's beliefs and, you know, when they're using the technology and designers' beliefs when they're designing the technology, they don't always match. Sometimes you get people who have these seemingly innocuous kind of devices that they're using, whereas actually from the designer's perspective, this is like a data gold mine, right? And this is, a, again, kind of a safety issue. We want people to know what risks they're getting themselves into. We want to have something like a label. You know, I don't know if you've ever visited California, but I, everything has this label. This is known to the state of California to cause cancer, right? And is there something like this with data where it's like this device is known to the state of California to, you know, be able to tell if you are suffering from a depressive episode or something like that. And trying to kind of bridge these belief gaps when it's relevant to do so is, I think, a really important consumer protection imperative. Um, and also, I'd be curious to hear a lot more about that dynamical systems work, too, at some point. Um, thank you for the question. Yes? I was curious about the hypothesis you had in the heart rate study, in that Yes. When high heart rate can also have happy balance, if you're excited and all the rest of that. So I was curious about why you picked that particular direction. Yes, great question. So when I was going to the study, I shared that, you know, you have this excitement high heart rate um, kind of kind of meaning. So this came from these studies here which had people, again, listen to their own heart rate. And their heart rate was, in fact, manipulated to be either high or, high or low. Again, it's too kind of. And then people were, out, were asked afterward, how are you feeling? And the results of that study were simply that when people were told they had a high heart rate, they rated themselves more negatively in these kind of negative balance categories. Now, I can imagine some reasons why that may have happened. For example, I'm clearly not excited. If my heart rate is high, well, I guess I must be nervous. So it doesn't mean necessarily that there's no high, you know, no positive valence association with heart rate. But because they weren't present in these studies, we decided to stick with the negative valence that had been found in prior work and form an hypothesis. Um, but it's a really good call out. And I hope that there's also maybe some study in the future about positive valence um, stuff as well. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah. Uh, so your study on the engineer engineering uh, mm -hmm. has making about the mind. Uh, around True. Yes. Great question. Okay. So to start with, you know, kind of I think the framing for this question, because I think Don Luke and I share this kind of like high school training. You know, these artifacts are kind of in the middle of all of these social kind of discursive practices and uh, the way that you know engineers are trained, what artifacts are supposed to do, how users are imagined to encounter artifacts, all shape these artifacts, and not just these neutral things. Right. So Donald's question here is, you know, why these engineers, given this reality, given this messy reality? Okay, so I gave some really reductive um, explanations here somewhere. Um, and kind of the rationale here is, first of all, we have these uh, EEG devices that are expanding as consumer hardware products. So what's left on the other side of this is software. The people who are going to be expanding and new to the practice now are going to be software engineers, so we decided to stick with software. Okay. Now given that, who are these software engineers who are likely to actually use the brain, pick up the brain computer interface and start building a product with it? Our hypothesis, and again this could be tested and falsified in the future, is that it would be people who say, I know about BCIs, I'm interested in using them. And then once you have the software engineer interested in BCIs, they go out, you know, go to the sharper image or whatever the modern day equivalent is, grab a, you know, Muse headset, take it home and start using the API, the SDK, what are they going to do? What are they going to believe? And the kind of hunch here is that these are the people who are going to build that first frontier of apps. Um, now what I really wanted to do and just haven't been able to do yet are find some people inside Facebook who are working on the brain computer interface team be like, listen, what is going on here? What are you doing? Because some of them, I know personally, they're BCI experts, and they should know that this is not going to, this is way far beyond you know, what we imagine the frontier is. Maybe you know, 13, 14 words per minute is realistic for any EEG BCI. But <laughs> certainly saying that's typing with your brain is a stretch. So kind of, I think that there's kind of, how are these people building it? And also, how are the work that these engineers doing kind of metabolized in the organization to end up in this PR, I don't want to call it a stunt, but you know, it's kind of PR understanding. What's that process like? Isn't this the company that bought Oculus? This is the company that bought Oculus. Yeah. So, so there's this really interesting company that I wouldn't be shocked if somebody buys. It's called Neurable, this one right here. So they're saying we're taking EEG BCI and we're putting it in a VR headset. You can attach it to your HTC Vive or whatever. And uh, it's some researchers at the University of Michigan. So again, this is very legit, very legit. They really know, you know what BCI is all about. And they're using this specific signal called P300, which I can talk about more uh, offline. And I think that the play here is that, yeah, you know, there are these product synergies. And in order to justify these product synergies, we have to do something that looks like basic research for a moonshot. And then you end up with you know, a bunch of, of researchers working on this project that is probably to their mind implausible. And this is kind of a crazy institutional configuration to think about. You have people doing something for a good reason, uh, maybe, you know, so product reason, let's say. You have something, do, you have this market-driven reason, and you need to build this kind of institutional rationale to get investors on board, to get hype, to get buy-in from users. Uh, you know, this isn't just for advertising, this is for you. Um, so I think this would be a fascinating thing to study, and I hope I get a, somebody gets an opportunity to get access. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Give me a pause.